Charlotte for coming to my talk. Uh, there is some swag at the end of the room, so feel free to take them after the talk because now I'm talking and I'm expecting you to. So I'm Vladimir de Turkheim. I'm the lead Node.js engineer in a security startup. We do AppSec, we are named Screen. But today I'm mostly talking on behalf of the Node.js security working group. I'm a member of that and I'm also a Node.js collabor collaborator. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Paul Defet or find me on GitHub. I think the first thing we should discuss is what is Node.js? Do, do everyone knows what is Node.js or in the room? I mean, okay, let's quickly go around what it is. Node.js is a runtime, uh, like Java, like Ruby, like Python, and the main language you use with that is JavaScript, thanks to a piece of software named V8 that is being developed by Google uh, for the Chrome web browser. So most of you have a web browser on their laptops, so on their cell phone, so you have a JavaScript runtime locally in the browser. Node.js is another one that does not really need a web browser to execute JavaScript. It has one specificity, is that it's mono-threaded. So you have only one thread for the whole JavaScript process. What does that mean? That means you can do only one thing at a time. In a Java web server, each time you've got an HTTP request, it creates a new thread, and the HTTP request is, is uh, handled in that new thread. In Node.js, you've got a mono-thread where everything happens. So the question is, how can Node.js handle more than one HTTP request at a time? Because if you've got one thread, you can do only one thing. And that's why Node.js is asynchronous by default. That means that when you are having a web server, most of what it does is waiting. It's waiting for connections, it's waiting for, an HTTP, for a SQL database to answer a query, it's waiting for another service to answer something. All this time basically is lost in a multi-threading environment. In Node.js, when, uh, uh, when to answer an, an HTTP request, you are waiting for other data, you can start to handle another HTTP request, start doing other things. That's why we call it asynchronous, because most of what you do will happen when there will be time for you to have it. It's actually extremely efficient, and that's how the Nginx web server is working and handling so many requests at the same time. One of the large interests of Node.js is the ecosystem. The ecosystem is built around a tool named NPM, that is also a commercial company that handles um, a package registry. And NPM is currently the most popular package registry in the world. As you can see, it's outrun Maven Central pretty quickly, and it's still growing exponentially. You look at this uh, curve every other year, it has the same shape, because NPM ecosystem is always growing uh, in, uh, incredibly. Node.js is used for a lot of things. Uh, the main idea is to build web servers with it, and it's pretty powerful at it. A lot of people like to hack around and do IoT. And one of the other main use of Node.js is front-end tooling. So if you're working in a company that has a front-end website, it's extremely likely that the front-end developers have Node.js locally and use the NPM ecosystem to get React, to get Vue, to get Lodash or even jQuery. And they are using NPM and Node.js locally daily. Um, a quick word about who is handling Node.js uh, and who is in charge of Node.js security. So Node.js is actually under a foundation named the Node.js Foundation. That's uh, under the umbrella of the Linux Foundation. Uh, the Node.js Foundation is vendor neutral, sponsored by a few glorious sponsors like uh, Microsoft, HackerOne, or Google, and it's currently deciding to merge with the JavaScript Foundation that is another open source foundation. Node.js is an open source project and technical decisions are taken by the Technical Steering Committee for Node.js, uh, also known as the TSC, that is made of most active Node.js open source collaborators. The TSC has chartered a security working group that is in charge 
of policies and process regarding security for Node.js core and Node.js ecosystem. Uh, we handle a vulnerability, uh, an open source MIT licensed vulnerability base, meaning if you want data about vulnerabilities in the Node.js ecosystem or about Node.js core, we handle that. And we are also in charge of evangelism and assistance for the whole ecosystem to help maintainer building safer modules. This working group is actually handling two bug bounty programs that are offered by HackerOne, and we thank them for that. The first one is a bug bounty for Node.js core itself, if people find vulnerabilities in the runtime itself. This HackerOne uh, program distributes rewards thanks to a sponsor that is the Internet Bug Bounty, the IBB that sponsors other projects like Python or Ruby. Uh, so if you find a vulnerability in the scope of that bug bounty program, please don't find vulnerabilities in the test of libraries we used in Node.js, that happens. Uh, we might give you a reward for that. Also, uh, after that, there is a private repository where uh, selected co contributors and uh, third party members of the, of the community can fix Node.js. Please feel free to sit down, there are a few free chairs stay at the back. Um, also, there is a second bug bounty program for the ecosystem, meaning you remember those millions of packages on NPM. We are having a bug bounty program for that. Uh, you can't get rewards for it yet. Uh, two weeks ago, Canbase contacted us. They want to sponsor it, so we will soon start to give rewards for some, uh, some uh, vulnerabilities. And for instance, there is a, a guy named uh, Olivier Arto who is giving a talk right now. And last week, he just came up to us and said, hey, I found 20 vulnerabilities in the ecosystem. It's the same one in 20 different packages. Can you help me having that fixed in the whole ecosystem? And we did that together, and that's the kind of thing we do. So if you're maintaining a package and you receive an email from us, we will help you make your package safer. Also, we've got a public repo of vulnerabilities for core and ecosystem, so feel free to build tooling, open source or internally in your, com uh, in your company. This is under MIT license, so you are totally free to use this data set. So now I will talk, it's Node.js Security 101, and I will discuss a few attack vectors I've seen in the wild in Node.js. And B1, there will be code. That's the only part, and there will be JavaScript code, and I know, I know, it's JavaScript. So don't laugh too much, please. That's my favorite language in the world. Um, so we will start easy with SQL injections, and I hope most of you are familiar with them, and we will go through a SQL injection in Node.js. That will be just to familiarize you with the code. So here you've got a simple JavaScript Node.js endpoint using the web framework Express, which is the most uh, popular web framework in the Node.js galaxy. So on line one, we take the application object and we add a get met method on it, meaning that we are registering a new endpoint and that will be a HTTP get endpoint. As a first argument to that method, we pass, uh, we pass the uh, endpoint URI, like this endpoint will be a get method on the path slash post slash ID, and the colon thing means the ID is dynamic. And then the second thing we pass to the method is a callback function. That's a function that will be called each time someone makes an HTTP request to that endpoint. And it takes two arguments, the first one being the HTTP request, rec, and the HTTP response, res. And we will get data from rec and push data into res. So on line two, what we do, we actually prepare a SQL query, select star from items where ID equals, and then we check the params of the HTTP request from the request object. Here we take the, the one named ID, and we add that to the SQL query. And as you can see, there is a terrible SQL injection because we are just concatenating strings with user inputs. 
Then we throw that to the database, database.run query, and the database answer with another callback function. That's because Node.js is asynchronous. You can't do synchronous call as you will do in Java. You can put the result in a variable with assignment. Then you just provide a function, and the framework will say, hey, no, the results are available. I will call the function with the result of the query. And then we push that in a JSON file to the uh, HTTP response. So no surprise if the first par if the ID parameter is the integer one, uh, the SQL query becomes select star from items where ID equals one, and the outcome of the HTTP request will be all the documents in the table that have an ID name one. And if the, the table is well made, there will be only one element. Let's hack into that because A, we are at AppSec, so we want to do AppSec. And what if instead of just an integer, someone was smart and would put one or true as an ID, as a parameter in the uh, HTTP request? The SQL query becomes select star from items where ID equals one or true, and the result of the HTTP call is totally different, and it's all the documents in the table. And so far, so good, that's just a basic SQL query, uh, SQL injection, as we've seen some in PHP, in Java, in Ruby, in Python, in every web language, really. Let's go through more Node.js attacks. So we'll be doing t type inferring or object injection. The idea of this attack is to push data into a web server with a type that is not expected. Because JavaScript is not a typed language and web framework in Node.js don't have by default type checking. Meaning that for instance, where a framework, will, where a web app will be expecting uh, a string, you could put an object. So let's go through this other controller. First line, we've got something we already know. This, way, this time we won't register a get endpoint, we will register a post one. And we will start to create a MongoDB query. So in MongoDB, you don't do queries with strings, you do that with objects and method on a database object. So on line two, we just create a query object and we will populate that with what we want to fetch from the MongoDB collection. Collection is the equivalent of table in MongoDB. So what we say on line three is if there is in the request body, in the payload of the request, a field named title, let's just put that into the query object. And if there is in the HTTP body a field named desired type, let's put it under the type name in the query object. And then we throw that at MongoDB and we wait for the response, for the result of the query. So once again, let's see how it goes in real life. If the body contains desired type blog, the MongoDB query becomes document.find type blog, which means give me everything in your collection that has a field named type and a value named blog, as a string blog. And as a result, you will get the document which have a field named type and the value blog. Since it's NoSQL, you don't know if documents have this field, you don't know what's the type of the field, you don't even know if document exists, that's NoSQL. Nobody knows where the data are. And Let's say we want to inject that with object injection. So in the nominal case, the developer who created this endpoint is expecting a string as a value for desired type in the HTTP payload. But nothing actually is preventing anyone from crafting a request in which they will put an object at this point. So let's say desired type is a sub-object then with $any, which translates to a not equal in MongoDB query language, and then the integer zero. The, sequel, the MongoDB query becomes document.find type not equal to zero, which translates to give me all the documents in the collection which field type is not the integer zero. And as a result, we will get all these documents in the collection because if it's properly made, we can expect that it contains a string as a value for the field type. 
So since there is no data uh, matching, type matching in Node.js by default, you have to add that by yourself, you can do object injection pretty easily. And that also works with other types where integers are expected, you can throw strings, and the framework will not protect you from, uh, against that. Now let's go to something that is even more JavaScript-y, regex dos. Does anyone has heard about regex dos here? Okay, so let's go through that. Regex dos, uh, it's, the idea in Node.js, it's, it's monothreaded, remember? So you can do only one thing at a time. So if I've got a very, very, very slow synchronous chunk of code, Node.js will never go back to other asynchronous operation. It will be just running that synchronous piece of code forever until it ends. So if you can find a regex in some code that is extremely slow, you can craft a payload you will send to the endpoint, and the endpoint will just take forever to run. But since we are in the JavaScript main thread, it will just block the whole process. So let's go through numbers. So on the left hand side, we've just a small piece of code. The idea is to have a regex in the, in the const r, and then we'll have a string in s, uh, that is an exclamation mark at the first iteration, and we just append A's at the left-hand side of the string. So I will only check that for a multiple of five because it's really, really slow to run this kind of bench. So when the string S only contains an exclamation mark, the time to compute a regex, the regex is pretty small. It's like a fifth of a millisecond. When you've got five A's and an exclamation mark, it's still pretty fast. I mean, it's way <coughs> under a millisecond. It's a tenth of a millisecond. <coughs> pretty much the same order of magnitude when you've got 10 A's. But what's interesting is what happens when you've got 15 A's, you almost get to one millisecond. And when you've got 20 of them, you go to 28 milliseconds. And when you've got 25 of them, you almost get to one second just to compute one regex uh, synchronously. So I went until 30, it took 28 seconds. And to be too fully transparent, with 35, it took more than one hour, so I stopped the bench. With 25 A's and one exclamation mark, you can break a regex, and that means that the whole Node.js server is unresponsive while it's computing this regex. So you want to protect your applications about bad regex. So as you can see, the chart doesn't mean anything because the impacts are so high, and that's a log scale. The impacts are so high, the, it's the exponential growth of the computing time is so high that you can't even see anything on a graph. And that's it for the code attacks. And now we'll go through something a bit sneakier. That's what I call ecosystem attacks. So that's a, so who in this company has a website? Whose company has a website? Everyone, right? So it's really likely that your website is using this package that's named Webpack. That's a package that front-end developers use to bundle their web application into one file or a few bundles. That's the, each node on this graph represents a package that will be downloaded on your machine when you download Webpack. There are 30, 30, uh, 337 of them, and that's all the people who have published write over these packages. That means all these people basically can run arbitrary code on your developer's desktop, on the developer's desktop of your company. And that's a mess, and that's the default installation. You do npm install webpack, you get all of this downloaded on your machine. Meaning that the possible point of failure are huge. If I compromise this package, I can compromise every user of webpack. Same for this one, same for this one, same for that one. And that's a prediction I'm making today here at AppSec, OASP California 2018. More and more attacks this year will target developers' desktop. Not through email phishing, not through bad uh, documents, not through Word documents um, with macros, but with tentative of using malicious NPM packages. And to demonstrate that, that actually happened last year a couple of times. And the main one is ESLint. So ESLint, 
is one of the most popular package in the JavaScript world. Everyone uses it to uh, check code quality. It's not supposed to be in production in your servers, but it's supposed to be run everywhere on, your, on the developer's desktop machine when they want to check that the code is um, is uh, formatted properly and following certain rule set. And you can define your own rule set, like never use this method. ESLint is downloaded half a million times a day. Half a million times a day. It's huge. Um, July 12th last year, someone managed to compromise the account of a maintainer of ESLint. And this person actually published two modules that are not ESLint, but upon which ESLint depends. Meaning when you install ESLint, you get these modules downloaded. He compromised, this person compromised those two modules with a small worm that actually fetched a pay, an attack payload from Pastebin, and hopefully someone managed to collect this payload before it was unpublished. And basically this payload was leaking the content of .npmrc file on developer's machine. That's where the npm token stands, meaning that if I can steal the npm token of someone, I can publish any package I want on their behalf. So if I steal the, the NPM token of someone who has published right over Express, for instance, I can basically warm 90% of Node.js servers in the world. So when this was discovered, uh, NPM as a company revoked all users' tokens at once. All of them, or for all users. They estimated that 4.5k user accounts have been compromised. <coughs> and they uh, took measure by adding the ability to enforce 2FA at publication of modules. Like, if you want to publish this module, you will have to provide a 2FA code. It's still not widely used in the community. At the same time, the Node.js working group uh, issued uh, communique for everyone in the community and pinged some uh, enterprise user of Node.js to ensure that they were not using malicious version of ESLint. And now for the last part, let's give you a few actionable items if you have Node.js in production or on your developer's desktop. Uh, so, first one, I'm surprised I have to say that, keep it up to date. We've got a predictable release cycle with LTS versions and maintenance version. Just make sure you are never using something that is not under maintenance version anywhere. That's high hazard and we won't issue patch for them. Review the use of critical modules. So there are some modules in NPM in node core, like file system, child process, that should never be called with user data that have not been sanitized. And that's the first thing. And that's in the booklet you can fetch at the end of the room. Most of these advice are in the booklet. Sanitize the inputs to prevent NoSQL injection, as I showed you before. I recommend using the Joy module for that, not only because it's made by a friend of mine, because it's high quality and the dependency tree of this module is, sl is small. You are not getting 1,000 of modules when you just download this one. Test your code for bad regexes. There is a really cool tool by my friend Jamie Davis uh, that basically scan your code base for bad regexes. Use it, it's on GitHub. Monitor your dependencies for known issues. Either you can use the open source database we provide you on GitHub, either you can just go next to the pool and there are like two or three companies doing that professionally with high support and they've got security researchers who always look for new bad things in the ecosystem and tell you about it. Monitor the dependency tree. So on the right hand side, we've got a module named requests that perform HTTP requests from a Node.js process. And on the left hand side, we've got a module named rec that perform HTTP requests from a Node.js process. Both modules do the same thing. Rec is slightly less popular than requests. That is one of the most popular in, uh, in the ecosystem. But when you download rec, you only download boom and hook at the same time. And that's the only dependencies you're having. When you download requests, you download more than 45 dependencies with the hazards that come with it. And if you look at the dependencies of Boom and Hook, they actually don't have any except each other. So when you download Rec, you have only three modules. When you download Request, 
you've got countless modules and that will involve. What's the difference? Uh, request is a standalone project. Rake is part of the happy project, that's another Node.js web framework that is uh, created to go toward enterprise. It's free to use, it's an open source license. But one of the philosophy of the happy project is to minimize dependencies that come from outside the happy project. So you can be sure that there will be limited maintainers and limited hazard with these uh, packages. Feel free to go to that website before downloading any NPM package to compute the, what will arrive. Thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, you've been an amazing crowd. You can ping me at vlad at screen.io, follow me on Twitter. The slides are already on Apple Cloud. They are slightly different, but I will probably update them. F please take the booklets that are at the end of the room. I don't want to fly back to Paris with that, that heavy. And I will take a couple questions if there is any. Yeah. Oh, there is a question at the back first. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, there are some uh, vulnerabilities uh, with types. If you use something like TypeScript or FlowScript, would that mitigate? Um, not really, because uh, TypeScript, when you use it, your code will be transformed into JavaScript before going to production. And TypeScript does not inject any type checking at runtime. So it's only a dev tool. Uh, it won't provide you with type protection at runtime. Uh, no, Angular, Angular, since Angular 2 is widely using TypeScript for everything, but you don't have, you have type protection only at runtime. Like, you can't prevent people, uh, sorry, only at build time. You can't prevent people from adding bad typing during runtime in JavaScript, except if you inject type protection algorithm using Joy or other type checking libraries. Is that clearer? Yeah. Do you recommend any uh, particular um, packages, uh, open source packages, to help, like in your CI/CD, to make sure that you're staying up to date with CVEs? So uh, basically, there are a couple open source tools. I don't really know them. I know that npm CLI has added CV checking. Uh, Sneak does that professionally. There are a couple other vendors. And sell, uh, shameless plugging at screen, we do even check at runtime. Like you have a production you have not been looking at for six months, we tell you there is a vulnerability in production at this point. So um, when you download NPM packages, you yeah. have two issues. One is staying up to date to prevent CVEs. <coughs> the second one is staying not up to date to prevent malicious code from being downloaded. Exactly. So how would you solve this problem, uh, considering that there is new releases of malicious packages that uh, once you upload, once you are on release, then you pick the new package? So uh, that's a tricky question, because basically there are not CVs, there are not vulnerabilities in all packages. And they come with a cycle, and they don't pop <coughs> every other day. We, we, we try not to, at least. Uh, the idea is don't go outdated, but monitor closely your dependency tree. Know who are the people who have code in your app. I know it's a lot to do, and I know that there is a startup whose name I forgot who is starting to provide that commercially. Uh, they are based in San Francisco, and another tool named, uh, another company named NodeSource as uh, what they call certified packages, in which they uh, advise to use certain packages or not. Another thing you can do at company level is to have your own NPM proxy locally and have a security team that will vet only certain version of packages. But you really need a security team that will have enough resources to maintain that. So basically, don't download any packages. When you choose a package, make sure you're not adding something weird. And follow up with release, read release note, and check the dependency of the dependencies. Except of, for healthy behavior in the JavaScript ecosystem, I don't have any uh, silver bullet solution to that problem. Uh, so which website did you use to generate the dependency graph with the uh, maintainers pictures on the left? That? Not, not this one. The oh, it's one. the same. It's just, uh, oh, okay. it's just a sub. This one is yeah. that's the same website Got as it. the last one. Thank you. So just get the slides and you will have the, the link. So 
sorry, not that one. Any last questions? Once again, feel free to ping me. I'll be more than happy to help you with your productions. Oh, there is a last one, sorry. Um, so to avoid the SQL injection kind of attacks, uh, is, means we are using SQLize, like a, it's, it's like a ORM tool. So is, is that helpful? Because we are, we are already using like JOA. It's like pretty good actually. Yeah. So is, is that enough? Otherwise, we need to do any other. So the cool thing about SQLite is it will prevent this kind of injection, except if there is a flow in the library, which is pretty good because it uses prepared statements under the hood. So it's a good library. But that's a bit why I put SQL injection at this point. Because SQLize is an ORM that actually mimics the behavior of MongoDB queries to build SQL uh, queries. And basically, when you're using SQLize, you might be vulnerable to this kind of attacks, to object injections. So you want to put a type checking library to ensure nobody is injecting SQLize operator in sub-objects where you are expecting native types. Yeah, it means uh, we, are, we, are, we are using like a JOI. Yeah, with the TypeScript, actually. OK, yeah. so just make sure you've got type checking at runtime. Oh, sure. And for each HTTP request that enters, don't trust user data. Don't oh, trust sure. user inputs. Thank you. No problem. All right, so 10.10 right now, so we're going to go ahead and take a break. <laughs> we're going to give you a lot of applause. Thank you.